Ich kann kein Deutsch sprechen, also muss ich Englisch sprechen. Gut. So, I am Arkady Barkovsky and I work for Yandex. Yandex is the only other search engine. So that it's the only national search engine that holds the majority share market share in its country. And uh, it does it uh, exclusive, competing exclusively by relevance and uh, quality. But rather than uh, talking about Yandex and search engine, I will start by trying to give you a larger picture from evolutionary pers perspective. And I will talk about the role of computers, internet, and search engine in the evolution as a whole. Hopefully, this will give you another perspective on the development of the internet, search engine, and social networks. And uh, I think uh, it will be somewhat entertaining to you. I made, prepared this presentation specifically for this conference, so I never made it before, so excuse me if there are some glitches. But uh, listening to the previous uh, talks, I think this is <coughs> a very right audience uh, for this presentation, and thank you for Dr. Christian Grugel. He started by suggesting that uh, we look at the internet from evolutionary perspective in a larger context. He talked about the invention of <coughs> writing, and uh, but we will go even further back. So uh, we can uh, look at uh, evolution of life in uh, different ways. I suggest that uh, we look at the whole history of life from perspective of knowledge. We can consider any living being as entities that carry some knowledge within them that is manifested in more or less deliberate behavior. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but everything living things do, from uh, single cell animals to humans to whole societies, is based on knowledge. Over time, more and more complex entities evolve from uh, single cells, eukaryota, multi-cell, complicated ones, and then, as I say, to tribes and civilization. And more and more complex behavior that is based on more and more complex knowledge emerges. So if we look at the evolution in this way, <coughs> we can bring into a single picture biological notion of life and uh, the society and technology and civilization together. Make sense? So let's assume that the manifestation, the behavior, is uh, a derivative of knowledge, and let's consider how knowledge is developed. This is a huge topic, and I will just outline the main piece of it so that I eventually can get back to the main subject of the conference, to the search engines. So in living organisms, at least originally, the knowledge was carried in the genotype, and the material form of the genotype is DNA. We will skip, for brevity, the relationship between genotype and phenotype, and uh, we'll forget that higher animals actually are not, their knowledge is not completely in their genome, but it, they have neural, neural system, brain, which play quite important role. And uh, most of uh, what I'm talking is pretty known, and uh, people like Richard Dawkins and other guys talked about that. So, rather than focus on, let's focus on the development of knowledge from simple to complex. At first, the knowledge, and uh, here I equate knowledge with the uh, <coughs> genome, was developing uh, by at random. Mutation selection, mutation selection, we go and go and go. So this is a very slow and inefficient way to try to put new things together. And uh, it's quite boring as well because there is no communication involved. So next step is more interesting because it involved communication. So sexual reproduction. This is, was a big step ahead, but from our perspective, for what we are doing here, we can look at it as the first time some communication, some information exchange came into existence. 
not just a random walk, but communication. Pretty slow and simple way of communication. Each organism was saying same thing over its life. Just take my genome and listen to it. Mix it with yours. But it's still communication. We take two informational structures and somehow force them to combine. So compared to the previous, it was quite explosive. And uh, this allowed to <coughs> knowledge to progress. After that point, everything else can be seen as enhancing the way to communicate, enhancing the ways different information you know, structures can combine and uh, <coughs> produce new informational structures. We'll skip the development of vision, of brain, neurosystem, and uh, also complex forms of learning and communication exhibited by high animals because for our purposes, these are just stepping stones to next major evolution, speech. So what makes us human, as we know, is ability to talk. This makes us unique in the animal world because we can exchange and develop information at incredibly higher rate than any other animal. We can turn uh, literally anything into a material form, sound, and pass it to another mind. So when people talk about telepathy, it's kind of, I have something in my head, and then it gets into somebody else's head. Speech is essentially telepathy. So since then, progress became great. Okay, so speech allowed mind transfer physical body. So it allowed to you, us to have single cognitive state across multiple people. Next step was, of course, writing. Tens of thousands of years passed, and this magical mechanism, new revolution, came into existence. And it happened, happened actually not a long time ago, within the times of our collective memory. Writing allowed knowledge exchange between humans to transcend space and time. Before, we needed to be in the same place at the same time, actually, to ex combine our knowledge. With writing, a message can be taken miles away and can be saved to be read later, a day later or 100 years later. This allowed building systematic knowledge bodies, religious, philosophical, scientific, pragmatic, that could be shared and coherently used by whole civilization. So this essentially was the beginning of civilization. This process was accelerated by many orders of magnitude by advent of movable print because it was replication. Print allowed spreading messages widely by producing as many copies of text as necessary. Then, of course, came media, telephone, telegraph. Further exploded the growth of communication rate. So this is just an outline before we come to the next step. There were a lot of smaller steps that <clears throat> in this process, each one may, might be interesting for a separate discussion, for a separate talk. Just uh, to digress and give you one small example. We think that print was a huge revolution that created a media to pass information to masses. Actually, Gutenberg invented a technology which uh, was enabling technology, but it did not really change the world. Paper was very expensive. It was made of linen, of cloth, 
and the books were items of luxury. So it would be only the Bible or in 18th century some expensive books for royalties, for gentry to be printed. What actually was required, cheap paper was required. And to give an example how important it was, in America, where in the 19th century, the world was still young, they did not have enough cloth, enough linen. So like, they couldn't just throw away rugs to <coughs> make paper out of it. Paper was even more expensive there, especially in the South. So some industrials mind thought, let's go to Egypt and take mummies. Because like, in the late Egyptian civilization, like between 33 and 28,000 years ago, pretty much everybody was mummified, even cats. So there was a lot of bodies wrapped in linen. And the idea was that let's go to Egypt, get these mummies, carry them on a boat to America, maybe burn the bodies while unwrapping them and make paper out of that. There were like at least two projects like that. I don't think any of them succeeded. But it's a, maybe a digression, just to give you an idea how many things were there and how one single invention print actually they did not change everything right away, but required 300 years to produce, uh, to get something else invented, cellulose, paper made of pulp. Okay, so, so far so good. Life evolution is development of knowledge. Development of knowledge pretty much is development of communication. Speech was the first revolution, writing, print and media allowed to <coughs> transcend space and time. So what next? Next, of course, computers. They multiplied faster than living cells and created the internet. Computers not only added to the ease and speed of access and exchange of information, as they subsumed everything that had been introduced before by print and media, they brought another fundamental difference. While all the previous inventions augmented spoken language by increasing the rate and amount individual could receive crossing temporal and spatial boundaries, one thing remained unchanged. Media are passive. It always requires a human and to mix and align all the information she consumes from the media. And it requires human <coughs> to make actions based on that. Media is passive. The author puts something in, the recipient takes it out, and takes in exactly form, same form as the author put it in. They can perceive it completely differently from the way the author intended, but that's not because of the properties of the media because of the properties of the individual. Computers provide not just another step in speeding up interhuman communication. They also participate in reasoning, decision making, and acting. So there are different ways, like for example, <coughs> what we had fluid, li liquid, uh, liquid, li liquid, and Hmm? Liquid feedback is uh, just a way that shows how computers help people, people to communicate. But this is not what I'm uh, talking about. I'm talking about the ways social networks and, more specifically, search engine help people to communicate. So, at first, there were programming. There was programming. A program is not just a prescription for a computer to give, to perform some actions. So originally, programming came when Turing decided to formalize what an algorithm is. And then in the uh, 50s and 60s, and uh, probably until now, programming languages were used to express algorithms, to exchange information between <coughs> mathematicians computer specialists and engineers. So a program 
is something quite interesting. At the same time, it's a representation of the information, and it's something that allows computer to perform an action. So this is, once again, I want to stop on this, it's a magic. It's communication combined with action. It's similar to DNA. A DNA is a represent obviously an informational object, but at the same time, introduced in the right environment, it creates certain processes that run. So this is probably as important as invention of DNA. Of course, uh, this uh, use of computer languages for communication was quite limited. But if you think of writing itself, when it was invented in Egypt 5,000 years ago, it was limited to some sacral purposes. Nobody would even think about writing down a poetry or sending a message. Or when it was reinvented in Mesopotamia, it was used just for accounting. Like very similar with computers that were used for rocket science and for accounting, as for banking. It took uh, many hundred years for writing to <coughs> take over and become the <coughs> universal communication media. So computers made this in 30 years. So early search engines were powered by algorithms and the knowledge embedded in the web. I will talk about this a little bit later. Today, they are powered by the knowledge that users have shared with them. Computers, internet, communicates with people billions times a day. Billions times a day, people provide their opinions to so-called internet. We kind of used to think that people ask questions and uh, <coughs> the machine answers. In fact, it's of course two-way communication. Every time a user clicks, spends a certain amount of time watching a page or a video, she provides the internet with her opinion. And this opinion, aggregated with those of other users, is applied, and the next answer produced based on that. So clicks pretty much doing that. So essentially, search engine, but think of it. Who produced the knowledge? It was the users, the people. So indeed, we are not talking to a search engine. We are talking to other people in indirect manner. So if you think of this way, you may think that search engine users indirectly communicate with each other. Using, and search engine is an intelligent intermediary. And this gray cloud, I did not kind of which represent shared cognitive sense, now includes not only the people, it includes the internet itself. So, essentially, when we think of AI, mostly people think of robots that are going to take over people's jobs, or people think about some super powerful machine that start, will start making decisions for us, like uh, <coughs> Terminator type of things. Indeed, search engines and social networks are intelligent, in artificial intelligence. And that's where artificial intelligence meets society. They are already part of our collective intelligence, and they're already inseparable from the way we think, both as individuals and larger groups. Social professional circles, you cannot really imagine as academic community without search engines. That's the way people communicate now in science. But of course, in uh, local communities and the whole nations. Search engines are acting as intelligent intermediaries in these social groups. And they have huge power over development of these social groups. As uh, <coughs> Professor Dirk Lewandowski mentioned today, users trust Google ranking more than themselves. So essentially, Google is just as big authority as parent or president. Okay. 
so I s kind of stressed that these are intelligent intermediaries, and we use them to communicate with each other. So our communication improves, more knowledge is accumulated. But they are not, they meaning search engines or social networks, are not kind of evolving on their own. The intelligence of a search engine or social networks is based on two components, software and user data. So somebody has created the software and once the search engine or whatever is created, it digests human behavior, human input, and produce <coughs> knowledge. <coughs> Developing IT and artificial intelligence software is uh, not trivial, to say the least. It's uh, kind of magical. But magical or not, there is no like hidden secret sauce. Most of our technologies originate in academia. These people from academia get acquired by corporations, and the, but eventually knowledge gets back, enhanced and optimized, either through publications, some things get in open source, but uh, and also people just move from one company into another. So, however complicated and advanced software is, it is available to everybody. If you put enough effort, you will learn it. If you are a company, if you put a reasonable amount of money, you will get it. But user behavior data can only be accumulated once you have a big engine. So you have to launch this active intelligent intermediary that is used by millions of people. Only then it starts burning. So essentially, when we say humans put intelligence there, it's not so, oh, sorry. It's large <coughs> corporations who do that. The actually people who shape intelligent inter <coughs> intermediaries are the companies who hold user data. So, and I think it sounds unfair. Unfair for many reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, such intelligent intermediaries have huge power, economical, social, educational, business, cultural. And if some entity controls intelligent intermediary, it has this power. So not surprising that people are afraid of it. Not surprising, like for example, India does not want to accept free basics. Facebook comes, free internet for everybody. People are afraid <laughs> of that this intelligence will be controlled by some unique entity. But even if uh, we are not paranoid about power, in the end, we always have governments, they have power, and maybe it's just good for us. It seems, uh, to me at least, kind of wrong that the whole process of evolution gets controlled by few super corporations. I don't know, it just feels wrong. And uh, then, of course, there is economical reason. Let me quote, oh, where we are? My friend, Kira Radinsky, she is like a brilliant woman, got all the rewards for scientists under 30, worked for Microsoft, Google for everything, now she's <coughs> doing machine learning on a large scale. So she says that today companies are building their IP not solely on technology, but rather on proprietary data and its derivatives. And 
as ever increasing amounts of data are collected by businesses, new opportunities arise to build new markets and products based on this data. This is all to the good, but what happens next? Data becomes a barrier to entry to the market and thus prevents new competitors from entering. As a result of the few established players' access to vast amounts of proprietary data, overall industry competitiveness suffers. This hurts the economy. So she was writing this about <coughs> different industries, but if we think search engines are in the worst situation from this. So if you look at the, the history of the search engines, it's kind of outlined here. As soon as it, <coughs> your Wolfgang already presented this, so thank you, it's kind of, but I sum, summarize here. So when search engines, when internet came into existence, immediately search engines came in. And initially, there was no magic, there was no real intelligence. It was keyword search. Recall was the king. Nobody really was worried about relevance. If you have a page, that's good. The users will find it. So, like, Excite was like that, and pretty much Alta Vista, although they were pioneers in machine learning for ranking, they really stressed the ability of a user to find the result just by keyword phrases. Some of friends of mine never switched from Alta Vista, even after it was acquired by Yahoo and hidden on some <coughs> demo site, because they wanted control. First, uh, relevant scoring was a simple formula. We realized that actually it's important to rank results. I worked at Inktomi at the time. We were powering pretty much 95% of all searches in the world. And we realized that something better than just plain recall was needed. But our formula was just not a, really a polynom that has three parts. Weights in the words, in, in the document, something related to proximity, and I even don't remember what else. It uh, was very, very simple, and uh, it was uh, pretty much a hack. There was, the company was maybe 150 people, and just two people were working on ranking. Crawling infrastructure was the key. Just, uh, I'm repeating this, it's in a way it's similar to invention of movable print. You already have everything, but you need some important things to actually make things happen. And then the first intelligence in the search engine came from page rank. It, algorithms started using human knowledge, human's input. In those times, before link farms and everything, people just voted for importance of the page. If a page is important, it would have links. So that was the first kind of seed of artificial intelligence in search engines. Important thing is that the links are out there in the web. They are available to everybody. And uh, Professor Lewandowski is actually kind of focused on that stage of search engine development. Index is a very important thing. It's, I, and I think it would be really great to have open index, but that kind of part reflects the state of the 90s or early 2000s. So we can only do as much with the data that is available from the web. In, uh, if I don't, not wrong, somewhere around 2006, Eric Brill wrote a paper at Microsoft showing the importance of user query logs. And since then, real search engines really became this communication intermediary and real intelligence started emerging. So once again, <coughs> talking Eric, <laughs> the Hamas, they just uh, take user behavior, a little of 
secret sauce, which may be not as secret. It takes a lot of work, but uh, and uh, you you have it. So to build a new search engine now, you really have to access user behavior. And you can only access user behavior if you have <coughs> millions and millions of users. One million is not really enough. You need at least five, six, ten million. In order to actually serve a country, you need to have at least five or ten percent of population using your search engine. On the other hand, in order to support your search engine, it's it's expensive to have a search engine. You need to monetize. You cannot go for long without monetization. In order to monetize, you need to reach 20%. So this is very difficult. And uh, this part of my talk, which kind of uh, I'm ending here, is uh, to show you the importance of this. So people are concerned about privacy, and that's good. People are, I'm just repeating what I said. So I think that it's unfair that we have just one teacher. The teacher may be very, very good, but it's better to be able to look to the others. Because, and also, if all the human knowledge is concentrated with one corporation, and I'm talking not about algorithms, not about knowledge that can be written down with the language. I'm talking about the knowledge that people pass into the search engine without even thinking about that. And it's not personal data. As Eric explained, you can easily find ways where such personal data is separated from this overall knowledge. So if this new IP data IP is concentrated within one or two companies, then it blocks everybody else from participating in the new economy, <coughs> which you talked about. So this future economy is data-based. And I'm sorry I keep repeating the same thing again and again, because on one hand it's pretty simple third, but it seems to be not obvious. People say data is cheap, raw data is cheap, but when you have it, you can produce very valuable artifacts. And if you don't have access to the data, you are out. Okay, so there can be different ways to cope with it. I'm focusing on the third one. So, we have some search engines, but uh, I guess it was in your talk when you had different names and clicks, <laughs> but uh, they all good. So, I know all four of these and, uh, oh, MetaGear I put it because I'm here, so. But th th those four, Quant, Sesnam, Clicks, Estella, they definitely deserve a lot of respect. They are very different. I, if you ask me, I can describe them, but they all definitely deserve respect. But essentially, do they have, and of course, Doug that go is, uh, Gabriel Weindorf is a really wonderful guy, and they're doing a great job. They are not getting 10 million of users. So they are not really sustainable. They are not going to stand and <coughs> provide that foundation for new digital economy I have been talking about. We think we can do this. So uh, I don't know how much do you know about Yandex, but and it's a Russian search engine. It's a, a Dutch company. Uh, we are registered on NASDAQ. When we went public, we were pretty much the biggest IT company in Europe. And uh, 
we still have about 60% of uh, search in Russia, 50 or more million of users a month. We, despite the collapse of ruble, ruble is like maybe one third of what it used to be, we are still growing. And uh, so it's pretty much solid business. Having this solid business, actually in a better times than now, we decided why don't we try to see what will happen if we go into another country. And uh, we decided to go to Turkey. So this graph pretty much reflects the, our history in Turkey. And it's quite interest, an interesting graph. So we were quite naive when we went out there. We did not realize how important the search quality was. It's indeed a little bit strange because from our experience fighting Google in Russia, we knew that quality is critically important. We were dominant <coughs> in Russia since early 2000s. Everybody loved us. So we are focusing on the things that people needed more than <coughs> less important things. And we actually still have a link to Google on our search result page saying that if you don't like our results, try Google. Now it uh, has mostly historical value, but in early 2000s, we did not consider Google as a competitor. They did not care about Russia. And uh, we just thought, OK, we will serve our part of the queries, and Google will serve theirs. So we even did not have English documents in our database. When Google came in and the competition began, it turned out that he is not our brother, not a younger brother, as we looked at them in, at first, not a bigger brother than we looked at them in, by mid-2000s. It's a kind of an enemy. And it turned out that every small gap in quality is a hole through which users leak. If you are even on 90% of queries, but on 10% of the queries, you are not as good, that's a hole like in a tub. If you have a tiny hole, it leaks, you will lose all your users eventually. Somehow, when we went out to Turkey, we thought that if we just will put good enough search engine that serves 80%, 90% of the queries, good enough, we will become popular just because people would like novelty, that because people like a choice, and we launched our search engine. So we started small, 2% is very easy to get with any novel thing. And we started distribution. We were distributing, paying for distribution pretty hard, and we reached 7% and could not move anymore. And also, when we would stop paying for traffic, it would just go down and collapse. So we tried an experiment, we stopped paying for traffic, and we went down to three something percent. We didn't give up. We made Turkey first for several months at Yandex. The slogan was Turkey first. You, we, ha we have to improve Russian search engine because it's like in Alice in Wonderland. You have to run as fast as you can in order to stay at the same place. But everything that we would do, we would first try to do in Turkey. And by our measurements and also by some third-party third measurements, we actually match Google by now. The third-party measurements, I trust them, but they're too good for me. They found out that our results, it was uh, in May last year are actually better than Google on side-by-side -side test. Users, their panel, users prefer Yandex two times out of three to Google. I don't know how this can be because, like, <coughs> in uh, my team in Palo Alto, we had a saying, if your 
measurements show that you are better than Google, first try find a bug in your measurements. But uh, this was a third party, and they measured it like that. To tell the truth, they tried different combination. They took our results, Google results, and rendered them anonymously using Yandex design, using Google design. So guess what combination the users liked best. They liked Yandex results rendered as Google. <laughs> and uh, so if you look at this is how it started growing. It, it, this is just uh, the last part of that graph once we have had relevance. So what we learned? We learned that it is possible to build a search engine to a new market from scratch. Indeed, by now, we have an internal system we call country by button. It's a combination of software and processes that allows us to start from scratch and build pretty good <coughs> search engine that can be shown to <coughs> the users. It will not be still competitive, but it will be good enough. So we know that it's possible. Then another thing we know, that product quality cannot be any inferior to the existing solution. The users will not stick if you have holes. We learn that it's possible to build a search engine that the users will stick with. And another thing we learned, that there is no way to get out without distribution partner. This uh, pretty much matches <coughs> what Eric was talking about. He showed the slide how Google spending, spendings are <coughs> that R&D, actually building a search engine, is just one-sixth of the budget. Everything else is about getting it out to the users. And uh, Yandex, being relatively big but still a <coughs> small company, does not have resources to do the distribution in a new country. We can build a really good search engine that is distributable, but we need to find a partner who will be distrib distributing it. And $7 billion <coughs> with three and a half for search is a pretty much a good chunk of money for somebody to be interested in. So we are looking for partners for Germany, for France, for Indonesia, for any country. Okay, so let me just tell you what you can see here. This is the power of distribution. So this was probably August. No, I don't remember what exactly it was, but it was like last year that Firefox set a default to Yandex. Before that, we were around 4% higher than 2% in Chrome, lower than 50% at Yandex's own browser, but pretty low. And then Firefox kicked, changed the default, and some users restored Google, some users stayed with Yandex, and uh, th since then it's slowly growing. So this kind of shows that with distribution we can get these magical 20%. This is another graph pretty much showing the same thing. A red line is Yandex in Turkey, blue line is Bing in Turkey. And the bump is Edge putting Yandex as default. We, as it, the switch was not immediate and we also have to do some promotion for people to know that they can switch to Yandex, but it's growing and growing and growing. Well, so what can we know? The audience will not switch. <coughs> Partnerships is what necessary. We need a major local partner and uh, the last thing is uh, kind of what makes 
it's difficult for a Russian company to present a choice. So when we come and say, we give you a choice, say, uh, Russians. Okay, that's, uh, I'm running out of time. Just, I have a not talk <coughs> about the future of choice, what actually search is going to become. Of course, uh, mobilization is going on, and uh, being on mobile is very important. But uh, another trend uh, that is picking up and will actually carry over is intelligent conversational assistance. So the interaction, the user sessions with search will be different. They will not take away everything. This fast typing and immediate answers that clicks provide will be there. But in cases, in more and more situations, you do not really want to type a small screen. You want just to talk and tell what you need. You will want to talk with voice in the car. You will be talking with keyboard on a stadium or wherever you are. But this is what search is going to turn into. This is essentially a matter of the interface, just as we are bringing knowledge graph instead of uh, 10 links, just as uh, we are combining, putting pictures, video, Twitter. It's just, how to say, human interaction part. What's behind the intelligence, finding the right answers, is uh, pretty much comes from the search engines. Of course, it's going to be multimodal, as I already mentioned, touch, speech, typing. And it's going to be more and more about knowledge, things, and actions. Web and documents will still be there, but as they're just a transitionary element. Okay, so... Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit.